acute complications of uh, diabetes mellitus and uh, we'll be going through it like in uh, case scenarios and then we'll talk about acute complications uh, which they can happen and uh, briefly we'll also discuss that uh, what to do in a patient who has to undergo some uh, acute uh, emergency procedure or surgery if he's a diabetic. So our first case is a 22 year old male who has presented the medical emergency with an altered state of consciousness. He has history of fever and uh, vomiting and abdominal pain for the last two days. Uh, on examination, he is febrile, his pulse is around 120, blood pressure is 90 over 70. Uh, he had a dry lips, uh, there is an acetone odor uh, in his breath. Uh, laboratory uh, investigation shows a total leukocyte count of 23,000, hemoglobin is 15 gram per deciliter and urine complete shows uh, 3 plus ketones and uh, 3 plus uh, glucose with a blood sugar level of 456 uh, milligram per deciliter. So it's quite obvious the, the, the acute complication that has developed in this gentleman is diabetic ketoacidosis, right? And uh, the next question is that what should be the next uh, investigation to uh, do in this gentleman? So as uh, it's obvious that uh, he is a diabetic, or uh, if uh, possibly if it was previously not known, many a time type 1 diabetic are not uh, previously known to have diabetes and their first uh, presentation in the emergency room is uh, with this complication, particularly type 1 diabetics. But having a single reading of blood sugar of 456 uh, with urine positive, with ketone positive, so we have diabetes, we have ketosis and next thing we need to uh, establish is presence of acidosis and that would be check through checking the pH of the blood or going uh, for uh, RTL blood gas analysis which will tell us about the pH, which will tell us about the status of uh, bicarbonate and uh, anion gap and all that. Our next case is uh, a 60 year old female. She is known diabetic uh, for the last 20 years. She is taking regular insulin. She reports in emergency room in altered state of consciousness with a pulse rate of 110, blood pressure of 100 over 70, a temperature of 110 and uh, blood sugar recorded at high on glucometer. And a high read, reading uh, on glucometer usually means that blood sugar in excess of around 600 mg in most of the glucometers. Again, her urine complete uh, obviously shows uh, tupus uh, glycosuria, but there are no ketones. Now this is again uh, in, in our first example, the patient was rather young with the blood sugar level of uh, 456 with ketones and here it is a relatively elderly patient uh, or middle aged patient uh, who is already known diabetic for uh, 20 years or so. Now this is, uh, uh, there are no ketones but there is a blood sugar level of high so sometimes we call this as hyper or smaller hyperglycemic state. Both diabetic ketoacidosis as well as uh, this uh, hyperglycemia uh, or hyperosmolar state of they, they uh, are hyperosmolar. But the only difference is that in one uh, there is an increased uh, utilization of fat to uh, to compensate for uh, or to produce uh, calories. And this uh, fat metabolism leads on to uh, development of uh, ketones. And in the other, there is only hyperglycemia, no ketosis. Right? So, uh, again, uh, what further investigation will help in this lady who possibly is, will be called as since she is in altered state of consciousness or going to comatose, the other name for this situation is hyperosmolar non ketotic coma, ONC. Right. Our case C is a 50 year old diabetic who works as a cashier at a supermarket and is brought to colleagues by colleagues in an altered state of consciousness and disorientation. He was noticed to have unnecessary arguments with the customer uh, over repeated mistakes in billing. His colleague noticed his uh, sweating and he fainted there and he was removed from duty and referred to hospital. Right. So, if uh, you are there in emergency duty, what would be the first investigations to be done in this gentleman and what diagnosis will you consider? 
Her fourth case uh, is a 50 year old female and uh, she is on uh, oral hypoglycemic agents for her uh, diabetes mellitus and she has admitted on surgical floor uh, through emergency department with the diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. She has been running fever around 101. Uh, her blood sugar uh, has been around uh, 300 plus and for the past uh, 48 hours uh, she has been running this uh, high grade fever and uh, uh, pain in the right hypochondrium. So medical consultation has requested by the surgical department that uh, we want to control our diabetes uh, perioperatively so kindly assist us. Now this is again a set, sort of an acute uh, situation where the patient has to undergo surgery and blood sugar is quite high so what needs to be done in this patients so we are talking of three common uh, situations uh, which can present acutely with diabetes and uh, they include diabetic ketoacidosis they include hyperosmolar hyperglycemic states or uh, hyper uh, hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma a third example of uh, the patient who is diabetic on oral hypoglycemic agents and was uh, unduly arguing with sweating is because of hypoglycemia. So that sometimes becomes a medical emergency. And then managing patient uh, of diabetes with concurrent illness or acute emergencies. We take one by one, how do you define diabetic ketoacidosis? The word itself is uh, explanatory that there are two, three components. There is diabetes, there is ketosis, there is acidosis. So we have all three components, the diabetes through hyperglycemia, ketosis through ketones present in the blood or urine and acidosis which is uh, decreased uh, pH as well as uh, decreased in bicarb and decreased in CO2 uh, which would determine uh, acidosis. So you have to have uh, all three things fulfilled uh, to make a diagnosis of, so there will be blood sugar done there should be ketones checked and there should be acidosis determined through arterial blood gas analysis. Why it happens? It happens because of uh, uh, the insulin deficiency, right? So this insulin deficiency is uh, the main stay of abnormality. Patient uh, either uh, there is a beta cell failure or they discontinue their insulin or there is a glucotoxicity and this insulin deficiency results in uh, a balance being tilted that this insulin deficiency would lead on to a other hormones like increased glucagon, there may be increased growth hormone, there may be increased of cortisol uh, to compensate for an acute uh, inflammatory or infective insult, there may be release of catecholamines. Now this insulin is deficient but these uh, pro-glycemic agents are those factors which increase the glucose, they are increased. So this result in balance being shifted towards more of glucose level being uh, elevated or high. The pathogenesis uh, is multifactorial. The liver has a major role to play. The liver uh, on one hand there is an increased glucose production gluconeogenesis and this contributes to hyperglycemia and this hyperglycemia leads on to hyperosmolarity and the hyperosmolarity would lead on to diuresis osmotic diuresis and of course this patient would become volume depleted. So one component is uh, in gluconeogenesis with hyperglycemia, osmotic diuresis and volume depletion. The peripheral tissues start uh, utilizing uh, glucose less and less. One component may be decreasing blood pressure leading on to but less of blood supply to the tissues and this decrease increased production and decreased uptake again contributes to hyperglycemia and again finally would end up in uh, osmotic diuretic and volume depletion. Now when there is uh, glucose there but not being utilized because of the lack of insulin or uh, deficiency of insulin which is required for uh, glucose to move from excess cell to the interstitial space then the body has to shift its energy balance from glucose to fat. So what results in that the adipose tissue starts breaking down and this uh, adipose tissue again is utilized for uh, production of energy but this would lead on to increased release of free fatty acids. Now this increased release of free fatty acids on one end would be utilized for uh, energy but on the same time they are ketogenic and they produce the ketosis or ketoacidosis and this ketoacidosis uh, reduces the 
the alkali reserves and patient becomes that's it as metabolic acid so the three components of uh, this uh, diabetic ketosis are hyperglycemia ketoacidosis or metabolic acidosis and volume depletion so when you are managing these patients you have to look after what to do for their hyperglycemia what to do for their acidosis and how to replace their volume which is depleted as a result of uh, uh, this uh, osmotic diuresis now the whenever you have a patient uh, who is uh, thought to have uh, diabetic ketoacidosis it is uh, necessary that you categorize them into that whether it's a mild type of ketoacidosis or a moderate or severe so when the plasma glucose level in all the condition would be in excess of 250 but when the ph of blood uh, on arterial blood gas analysis between 7.25 to 7.3 it is mild but when it is less than uh, 7.24 but more than 7 between 7 to 7.24 it would be called as a moderate acidosis but whenever your ph is less than 7 or 6.9 then it is a severe the anion gap uh, usually is uh, widened in patient with diabetic ketoacidosis so when it is uh, more than 10 it is uh, mild when it is up to 12 it is uh, moderate and more than 12 it would be severe similarly a bicarbonate of less than 10 ml per liter would be suggestive of uh, uh, severe ketoacidosis of course uh, ketones uh, would be positive in all three conditions both in urine as well as in serum uh, the osmolality may vary depending upon the blood sugar level and sodium level and other things but more importantly in mild ketosis patient usually are alert but they in uh, moderate ketosis they would be slightly drowsy and in severe ketosis they may even start to get stupros and may even be comatose the clinical uh, presentation of diabetic ketoacidosis uh, usually is that the patient uh, present this uh, more of a polydipsia polyuria general weakness weight loss nausea vomiting and abdominal pain uh, abdominal pain is uh, a very very um, uh, common and prominent feature in diabetic ketoacidosis and any diabetic complaining of particular type one diabetic complaining of any abdominal pain should be considered of having a possible diabetic ketoacidosis unless proved otherwise the other physical examination sign the patient may be hypothermic because of uh, this dehydration and volume loss tachycardia tachypnea small breathing is a name given to acidotic breathing which is deep and sighing type of breathing uh, they they have a deep breath and uh, it as if patient is sighing uh, the electrolyte disturbance is caused by so much loss of volume water as well as electrolytes uh, potassium along with that can cause ileus and which may be responsible for abdominal distension and pain as well acetone breath uh, the 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 increased production of uh, this uh, acetone uh, is usually smelled Uh, near the patient as if uh, rotten uh, fruit smell it is also called and patient may have altered sensorium the thing is that uh, the onset diabetic ketosis is usually relatively short it is usually few hours to few days right so the, any patient complaining of uh, acute illness in past 24 to 48 hours presenting with this uh, this type of complaints should be considered to have diabetic ketosis the causes are uh, multiple the primary root cause is patient is diabetic and uh, insulin deficiency is there he might be on insulin supplement uh, medication uh, most of the time they either uh, miss their insulin dose sometimes there is concurrent infection which precipitates the insulin requirement goes up and patient because of illness is not able to take the insulin that is really and then of course and when there is a patient is in case uh, suffering from an acute uh, insult or infection there is release of increased catecholamines cortisol glucagon from the body and they all we already mentioned that they are more uh, glucose producing agents or glucose uh, level gets increased because of breakdown of glycogen usually uh, there is uh, infection most commonly either it in the form of pneumonia or uti which precipitates the ketoacidosis sometimes alcohol may be sometimes they may have been having a stroke along with this as uh, 
in a precipitating event or as a complication. Many times we see we receive patient with myocardial infarction primarily and during the course of uh, the investigation it turns out to be that this uh, they are also having diabetic ketoacidosis acidosis and sometimes myocardial infarction can be considered as first presentation uh, of uh, decay in some individuals. Pancreatitis can be associated with trauma, certain medication like steroids can lead on to hypoglycemia and precipitate uh, uh, the diabetic ketoacidosis and most common factor is usually non-compliance with the insulin that the patient forgets to or does not take or does not cannot uh, take it because of uh, multiple factors. So in type 1 diabetic, the majority of the patient would be having a concurrent or precipitating event in the form of uh, UTI, 40% of them would have infections, 25% might have missed their insulin, 50% uh, of them presenting uh, for the first time with diabetic, they may not even be known diabetic and for baby diagnosed for the first time on that day. And then again, medical, surgical, emotional stress and sometimes it may be idiopathic. But in type 2 uh, diabetics, uh, diabetic ketosis is relatively less common. It is not as common as in type uh, because there is uh, not an absolute deficiency of insulin. So some of the insulin still is being uh, produced by the pancreas and uh, some of it may be uh, available. So patients don't go into ketosis mostly. But any intercurrent illness like myocardial infarction, pneumonia or prostatitis may trigger and may lead on to certain medications can trigger like the uh, steroids and clozapine and there is a, a new uh, class of drugs called as SGLT2 inhibitors sodium glucose co-transport inhibitors now these uh, agents uh, lead on to um, control of uh, diabetes through an extra glucose being excreted through the urine when extra glucose is excreted of course it again leads on to a relative deficiency of glucose in the body for energy utilization. So body start producing, uh, utilizing fat for production of calories or production of uh, energy. Now this fat as we already explained earlier, that this fat is ketogenic. It would lead on to um, production of ketones. So this fat, this patient, this class of patient may develop uh, ketoacidosis where there is no hyperglycemia it is called as a euglycemic or normoglycemic ketoacidosis which is uh, seen with the use of the uh, drug of uh, SGLT2 inhibitor class and uh, this is unique and uh, more and more people uh, are now presenting with that they would have a normal blood sugar level but still would be showing ketoacidosis because of the uh, fat metabolism being uh, say uh, enhanced. So, once a patient lands in the emergency and you have suspected diabetic ketoacidosis, the first thing is, uh, as we said, two, two, three, three things. Check blood sugar level, check uh, urine and uh, serum for ketones and check ABGs for uh, um, arterial bed gas analysis uh, for the determination of pH or the noting down the severity of the acidosis and similarly serum bicarb level which would be again ABGs would uh, be telling us about that. Uh, if your patient is stable go for a, some degree of uh, say inquiry like history and physical examination. Secure patients uh, ABCs or uh, what we call as uh, uh, airway breathing circulation uh, because these patients might have already collapsed as a result of a severe dehydration caused by osmotic diuresis and they required attention first of their blood pressure. Uh, check their mental status, check their cardiovascular and renal status through clinical examination as well as urea and creatinine. Check for some source of infection which is almost always there either in the unit diet or cut or some hidden focus, maybe prostatitis, maybe uh, otitis media. So this uh, should be a search should be made for that and evaluate the volume and hydration status of that patient and then some lab uh, studies uh, would be required. The immediate uh, lab studies which we probably need to do is arterial bed gas analysis, complete blood count with differential, uh, then uh, complete metabolic profile in the form of glucose, electrolytes, bicarbonate, blood urea, nitrogen and creatinine. 
check for serum ketones, check for urine ketones, check for urine for uh, infection, scent cultures, and not to forget uh, in a certain group of patients, particularly the middle aged or 50, 60 plus with concomitant ischemic heart disease, check for the cardiac enzymes as well. So, uh, serum glucose level is usually more than 300 during uh, complete examination as uh, for glycosuria or ketonuria. Uh, electrolytes, uh, you may have hypo or hyperkalemia both and sometimes osmotic diuretic diuresis might have led on to hyponatremia. There is hypophosphatemia, mm, serum chloride may be uh, low. Uh, Blood urea nitrogen is expected to rise as a result of dehydration and prerenal uh, azotemia or what we call it uh, prerenal uh, failure or acute kidney injury. Uh, arterial bed gases would help us in this determining the severity of metabolic acidosis. You must check the serum osmolality, uh, which is uh, calculated as uh, uh, 2 into sodium plus potassium plus BUN over 3 and glucose divided 18. Uh, this calculation of BUN over 3 or glucose by 18 to convert the milligram to millimoles of uh, each substance and usually the serum osmolality would be uh, 290 millimole plus uh, that would be called as hyperosmolar state. You also check for the anion gap and the anion gap is check, checked by knowing the serum and sodium and subtracting the value of uh, chloride and bicarb. And if this difference is more than 30, it would be called as a wide anion gap metabolic acidosis. To rule out underlying infection, you need to know the complete blood count. In case TLC of more than 15,000, there is some degree of leukocytosis in, uh, inherent to diabetic ketoacidosis without even infection. But anyone who has a blood sugar uh, Total leukocyte count of more than 15,000 should be considered to have a concomitant infection. Uh, ECG might be required to look for any possible acute ischemia, but more importantly, ECG gives us information about hypokalemia or hypokalemia through T wave changes in the form of U wave and flat T waves in hypokalemia and tall tent T waves in case of hyperkalemia. Uh, chest X ray may uh, help us uh, to, to look for any presence of uh, pneumonias uh, or consolidation in particularly the elderly age group patients who may have a respiratory tract infection as uh, their source of infection and precipitating factor for diabetic ketoacidosis. Rarely, rarely in a patient who is uh, losing uh, consciousness or uh, has altered consciousness, you need to do a CT scan as well to look for possible cerebral edema or maybe uh, this hyper or smaller hyper uh, Viscous, uh, viscous state and dehydration might lead on to uh, thrombosis of the cerebral vessels leading on to stroke. Serum sodium uh, usually is uh, checked and mostly in most of the patient with uh, diabetic uh, ketoacidosis and dehydration are likely to have hyponatremia uh, because uh, the, with the glucose uh, this uh, water is retained more as a result of uh, hyperosmolarity and this would lead on to dilutional hyper, hyponatremia. Sorry. Uh, potassium, uh, there is a potassium regulator in the uh, say kidney that there is potassium is exchanged for sodium and uh, because of uh, increased loss of uh, sodium, concomitant potassium is also lost and the patient usually are hypokalemic or have uh, hypokalemia but uh, uh, later on this dehydration and uh, the shift of fluid may lead on to uh, some degree of hyperkalemia. Similarly, when you treat these patients with insulin, it would lead on to movement of uh, glucose from extracellular space to the intracellular space. Whenever the glucose moves from extracellular to the intracellular space, there is a potassium moving in along with it and when this potassium uh, this is, is called facilitated transport. Now, this treatment of uh, uh, hyperglycemic state with the insulin and with shift of this glucose may result in hypokalemia. And uh, you might have to replace it. If you don't replace it, you might end up with electrolyte disturbances causing uh, certain uh, complications like arrhythmias, or muscle weakness, or paralytic ileus. So, potassium is to be closely monitored and washed. 
the main pathology in uh, this uh, diabetic ketosis and mainstay is osmotic diuresis leading on to very severe dehydration right so there is glyco hyperglycemia glycosuria glycosuria along with it takes water along with it and patient become dehydrated so the mainstay of treatment of first priority in these patient is managing their dehydration so you usually start with the normal saline and give uh, one to two liters over one to two hours in the first uh, one to two hours and then you check for if their uh, say blood sugar level uh, sodium level is uh, low you probably will start with uh, normal saline or half normal saline and usually at the rate of around 250 to 500 ml per hour but once the glucose uh, drops down to less than 250 then you usually shift it to dextrose saline or dextrose water or half normal saline resulting mean that uh, when you correct the dehydration and when you correct the hyperglycemia the hyponatremia uh, may end up in more sodium being retained and uh, patient may develop hypernatremia so you want to avoid uh, this hyponatremia developing in them Uh, it is to be administered cautiously, particularly in patient with the compromised cardiovascular status. So the fluid should be replaced, not all in one within first go. So you, it should take around 12 to 24 hours to have a total replacement. Usually, the patient have a deficit of around three to six, six liters in diabetic ketoacidosis, and uh, this uh, fluid replacement should be closely. Uh, Washed for uh, this uh, urine output and heart rate and blood pressure and respiratory status and care must be taken in patients who are, uh, as I said, have already heart failure or uh, who have uh, already uh, kidney disease who may not excrete this fluid. Uh, now all this uh, would require a very very close monitoring of your patients that uh, what was their vital signs. What was their potassium level? What how much fluid we gave? How much urine output had? What was their blood sugar? What happened with their ketones? What happened with their, uh, uh, acidosis? Now this would be charted in the form of a flow sheet. So each and every diabetic patient should be managed in a high dependency area where uh, maybe hourly or half hourly and depending on situation. Uh, later on, two hourly monitoring of each of these segments, starting from pulse, blood pressure, uh, their uh, urine output, uh, fluid administered, urine uh, uh, serum electrolytes, ABGs, and blood sugar level. They should be charted out and then trends noted down that what is happening to the pH, what is happening to sugar, whether it is uh, risk. Uh, say responding accordingly or we need to uh, step up the therapy after having checked the uh, corrected uh, the dehydration the next thing is that you have to lower the blood glucose level the initial blood glucose level uh, should be checked and then every one hour you should be monitoring that and we target is that with the, the institution of uh, Uh, therapy, which would be mainstay of therapy, would be insulin. We should have a decrease in blood glucose level of around 50 to 75 milligram per hour. And if you don't get that desired response, you might have to increase their insulin uh, dosage or infusion rate. Uh, once stable, which is stable, means that three consecutive blood sugar readings uh, are uh, in, on target. Then you can start uh, checking the blood glucose level. Monitoring may be more, uh, say, layerly or uh, after some interval, and adjust the uh, check it for hourly again when any uh, adjustment in insulin dosage is done. When blood sugar level goes down to around 250, the fluid which we initially started was normal saline is switched to dextrose water, right? Because if you continue on going saline, this would then lead on to Uh, hypernatremia, right? For diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, goal blood glucose level uh, is around 150 to 200 milligram per deciliter until the NN gap is uh, closed. So, 
after uh, say managing their uh, hydration status and uh, starting them on iv fluids in the form of around uh, 0.9% saline to begin with at a rate of around 100 to 120 ml per hour or uh, you may give uh, more rapidly or uh, may give 1 to 2 liters uh, during first 1 hour right and uh, 100 uh, then you can switch on to uh, focus on your insulin therapy so you can give an intravenous bolus of 0.1 unit uh, per kg body weight which would turn out to be something around 8 units for uh, around 80 uh, kg of uh, weight and then you set up a continuous uh, intravenous uh, drip at a rate of 0.1 unit per kg per hour again around 8 units uh, uh, per hour and uh, you continue this drip till you get a glucose level of less than 250 milligram and bicarb level of more than 15 millimole at this stage you probably decrease the infusion rate from 0.1 unit per kg to around 0.5 to 0.1 unit per kg in between so which would be around starting with the 8 units per hour to reducing it to around 4 units per hour when your blood sugar level has been around less than 250 on 2 consecutive readings and uh, or until the N N gap has been corrected the infusion rate uh, as I said the, the in, uh, IV insulin infusion can be reduced uh, by 50% of blood glucose is uh, decreased by more than 100 mg per decibel per hour. Our target was to reduce it by 50 mg per hour. But if it is more rapidly falling, then you can decrease the insulin infusion rate as you, if you started in the beginning at 8 units and after 2 consecutive reading, the blood sugar fell by more than 100 mg uh, in uh, previous hour, you can reduce it to 4 units. Similarly, you can escalate it up as well because if uh, the blood sugar desired blood glucose decrease in one hour has not been uh, up, more, up to 50 or more than 50, uh, then you can increase the increase in it by 50%, meaning by that if you started out with the 8 units, you can increase it to around 12 units per hour if uh, the desired blood glucose fall has not taken place. So once the blood glucose level has gone on to 250 mg per then the insulin insulin fusion may need to be decreased to 50% to maintain glucose at a target level of 150 to 200 mg per deciliter. Uh, patient of diabetic ketoacidosis should be treated with continuous intravenous infusion of insulin, not by subcutaneous in insulin. This Reason being that these patients are usually dehydrated. They are have a severe peripheral vasoconstriction. When you give uh, this uh, insulin subcutaneously to their uh, circulation, uh, to the uh, in the subcutaneous form, uh, the insulin may not be appropriately absorbed to begin with because it's a vasoconstriction and there is lesser blood spread to the soft uh, skin and soft tissue and all that and once you have corrected the dehydration and the patient's blood pressure starts improving, circulatory improve, there may be a very rapid absorption of glucose from the circulatory tissue leading on to very rapid hypoglycemia. So that's why that instead of using uh, subcutaneous uh, say the form of therapy in diabetic disease, you prefer to give it intravenous and that too in a continuous infusion form rather than boluses. In continuous infusion form, when you stop, uh, whenever there is a uh, rapid change in blood glucose level, whether it is a fall, uh, you can stop the insulin infusion and uh, the, the effect would be gone within a few minutes. And similarly, if there is a continuously ongoing hyperglycemia, you can increase the infusion rate and you can have the desired response. When we say that the DK had resolved, the target is that blood sugar uh, is less than 200 mg per deciliter. Their bicarb has gone above 18 milliequivalent per liters 
and their pH is uh, more than 37.3 so then we say that the DKA has uh, resolved what do we next at this stage you can switch now from intravenous infusion to subcutaneous insulin when this this target has has met when should we stop? Uh, usually, we give a short acting insulin supplement twice the hourly infusion rate, pinning by that if you are giving it uh, uh, infusion at a rate of 5 units per hour, give 10 units of uh, uh, insulin or double the dose of uh, continuous hourly infusion rate subcutaneously. Right? And then uh, if you don't give this, then you discontinue the insulin infusion there would be a very rapid again uh, rise in blood sugar level and of course after you are given after about an hour by that time this uh, insulin would start absorbing from the tissue and would be available for utilization by the tissues and then you can discontinue the trip but you probably have to also ensure that the patient has uh, started eating well and is awake because you, you may end up with that you treated him well uh, patient was not very well alert and oriented and uh, was not taking meal or was uh, nauseated and you stopped the insulin fian but gave it a shot the patient might end up in hypoglycemia the third component of management of diabetic ketoacidosis is uh, looking after their potassium right so if your patient on the beginning to begin with the potassium was 5.5 millimole there should be no supplement required but someone with the an initial reading of 4 to 5 milli between 4 and 5 milli equivalent uh, per liter would require 20 milli equivalent of uh, potassium being added to each liter of fluid being infused whether it's saline or whether it is dextrose water but someone with uh, uh, between 3 to 4 would require further as I already explained why we need this because once you give insulin the insulin would shift the glucose from extracellular to intracellular and along with glucose it would shift potassium as well and your patient would become hypokalemic now hypokalemia is sort of an acute kind of an emergency that it can lead on to arrhythmias it can lead on to acute cardiac uh, say uh, insults and can lead on to severe uh, flaccid paralysis and maybe atonia of the gut and maybe paralytic ileus. So, managing potassium in patient with diabetic ketosis is as important as managing their blood glucose level or managing their fluid level. So, if potassium uh, admission potassium is less than 3 milli equivalent, you may give 10 to 20 milli equivalent uh, per hour until potassium is raised up to 3 milli equivalent and then you can add the 40 milli equivalent into the one liter of uh, infusion being run. Bicarb uh, usually is not required to be replaced unless their pH is less than 7. If pH is less than 7, then you can possibly give uh, uh, 44 milli equivalent of uh, bicarb in around 500 ml of uh, half normal saline over one hour till the pH is around 7. Above 7, the correction would be done through the body's own uh, hemostatic mechanisms. A patient with uh, diabetic ketoacidosis uh, can have complications. The most likely complication is, uh, is uh, sepsis which is associated with this and particularly they may also develop a myocardial infarction. And we did talk about uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome uh, today with our uh, class uh, batch. Uh, and uh, this is again uh, one situation your patient may end up in ARDS because it is an acute uh, severe uh, metabolic stress to the body. Patient uh, may get dehydrated, may get hyperviscosity and so end up in development of thrombi in the circulation which may be in uh, venous circulation in the form of DVT which may be in the arterial circulation in the form of uh, thrombi. Uh, developing in the cerebral circulation resulting in uh, strokes as well. 
the other complication which during time we already talked about they may develop hypokalemia which can be responsible for uh, cardiac arrest cardiac arrhythmia person weakness they may develop hypoglycemia if you don't monitor their blood glucose very closely and uh, don't adjust uh, insulin dosage accordingly uh, they can be overhydrated because of uh, uh, say fluid uh, balance not being uh, matched Uh, with the urine output, and particularly those who are already sick, patient with the underlying cardiac illness, may develop acute pulmonary edema. Particularly, children it is more likely to uh, get, uh, say, um, fluid overload. Uh, Sometimes there's neurological complications like cerebral edema as a result of osmotic shift to balance of the blood-brain barrier. You reduce blood glucose level, so this would result in Uh, state of uh, hypo say mm, hyperviscosity and this would drag uh, fluid into the extracellular space or uh, within the uh, cerebrum and would lead to cerebral edema and these patient may uh, end up with the dehydration end up with the say cerebral edema resulting in neurological manifestations and uh, this is one thing which to be very closely monitored Uh, as uh, already tried to explain that the brain adapts by producing intracellular osmols which are called uh, idiogenic osmols they stabilize the brain cells from shrinking while patient is dehydrated when hyperosmolarity is rapidly corrected the brain becomes hypertonic and it start uh, say absorbing fluid from the extra fluid to the and this is the result uh, this results in cerebral edema development this uh, diabetic ketoacidosis must be differentiated from other uh, acidosis like lactic acidosis it should be starvation ketosis is another complicated uh, say differential diagnosis uh, alcoholic patients are likely to develop uh, ketoacidosis so this should be uh, kept in mind when whenever you have a metabolic acidosis uh, patient with chronic renal failure acute or chronic renal failure they also developed uh, metabolic acidosis so uremic acidosis should also be kept in differential diagnosis so now we come on to the second uh, acute emergency which is hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state now this is uh, hyperosmolar syndrome of when diabetic uh, which results from excessively high blood glucose levels and uh, this leads to blood to duct thick consistency or hyperviscosity HHS is uh, characterized by hyperglycemia and hyperosmolarity and of course there will be dehydration as a result of that but there is no significant ketoacidosis it is more common in type 2 diabetic and elderly patients and usually precipitated by severe dehydration and of course concomitant infections and uh, fluid loss uh, is even worse in uh, hyperosmolar state than even ketoacidosis sometimes they may have lost something to the tune of around 100 uh, uh, around 10 liter of water before they develop this hss the differences uh, between the dk and hss to be uh, kept in mind uh, in dk glucose is uh, usually around 250 to 300 400 but in hss it is usually above 600 phs would be less than 7.3 in dk but would be more than 7.3 by cup would be less than 15 in dk it would be more than 15 urine ketones are uh, significantly there more than 4 plus rarely uh, some uh, mild keto uh, ketones may be positive even in hyperosmolar state same is the case with the uh, uh, serum ketones uh, plasma osmolality if you calculate is always always more than 320 in hhs where it can be variable in dk uh, similarly mental status uh, can be Uh, altered in both situations but uh, it is more likely to be uh, affected in hyperosmolar states the etiology of uh, hyperosmolar is almost similar it is usually with due to acute febrile illness sometimes it can be stress some drugs can precipitate and then there are miscellaneous states uh, situation like hypothermia or intestinal obstruction or uh, steroids which can precipitate this state 
the clinical course of a hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state is that it usually drives over a period of days to weeks. It's precipitated by illness. So in uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, the onset was within 24 to 48 hours of uh, the illness, whereas it may be very slow and stable in patient of uh, hyperosmolar state. Uh, usually, uh, these patients are likely to have focal and general ICS. So, this is again something which should be noticed that majority of the patients uh, uh, with the hyperosmolar state can present or not majority, many of them can present with seizure fit, whereas fits are fits never occur in diabetic ketoacidosis because the, the ketones or uh, acetones, ketone bodies are very good anticonvulsants. The complications of uh, hyperosmolar hyperosmolar are because of uh, marked uh, dehydration and marked hyperviscosity in the form of cerebral edema. They may develop thrombiomolic complication. They may develop acute respiratory distress as uh, in DK. And they are also prone to develop septicemia and disseminated intravascular coagulation. Uh, their uh, hemoglobin is elevated because of uh, dehydration or hematocrit. TLC may be raised depending upon the underlying uh, reason for infection. Glucose is usually above 600. Uh, serum osmolality is uh, more than 320. And serum electrolytes, uh, they usually have uh, hyponatremia, hypochloremia, and sometimes both hypo or hypochloremia. But pH is always more than 7.3. And uh, their uh, this uh, dehydration lead on to an acute, uh, say, pre-renal type of uh, azotemia, where uh, urea to creatinine ratio is more than 30 to 1, and uh, sometimes there may be mild ketosis. Standard care is uh, that you have to hydrate them as uh, it was for DK. Uh, you have to give insulin therapy, similar uh, uh, as for DK, and you have to replace electrolytes. Fluid resuscitation has to be more robust. You usually give 0.5 liter in the first hour and 1 to 2 liter in the next two hours. Uh, hyponatremia need not to be corrected rapidly because this would precipitate cerebral edema. Uh, immediate treatment uh, should be with insulin. So they are usually started with uh, as 0.1 unit uh, per kg per hour and with the target blood sugar level of 250 to 300. And uh, so, if blood sugar level is less than uh, 250, you reduce it to 0.5. And uh, if it is between above 300, you gain increase the infusion rate. And if it is uh, more than 350, the infusion rate has to be increased by one unit per hour. Potassium needs to be replaced if potassium level is less than 5. Usually, 60 milli equivalent uh, of uh, added into one liter of uh, IV fluid. Uh, which is usually saline or half normal saline is added. The third complication we talked about was hypoglycemia. Now, this hypoglycemia again uh, can occur as a result of uh, either an overdosage of an oral hypoglycemic agents or uh, insulin or patient forgets to take meal after injecting insulin or after taking oral hypoglycemic agents. Uh, rarely, this hypoglycemia can be uh, in non-diabetic situation, maybe because of uh, insulin-producing tumors, or uh, sometimes it may be because of uh, autoimmune disorders like uh, in uh, Addison or uh, in patient with uh, thyroid disorders. The sign symptoms uh, of hyponatremia usually are uh, sympathetic adrenal system stimulation. So whenever there is uh, hypoglycemia. The, all the sympathetic system gets activated to produce more cortisol, more catecholamines, and this would result in sweating, palpitation, tremors, anxiety, hunger feeling, and uh, the lack of glucose, uh, say, energy to the neurons would cause the patient to be confused. He would have difficulty in concentration. He would become irritable. He may hallucinate. Sometimes he may even have, uh, say, mm, the uh, hemiplegia, coma, and uh, may, may end up in death even. So that's why that uh, recognizing hypoglycemia timely and preventing, if you 
this cyclic prolonged patient may be left with the permanent uh, neurological damage in the form of a um, hypoglycemic uh, neuronal damage or neuronal say injury so usually any blood sugar level below 70 should be considered as hypoglycemia uh, usually um, the first thing is to give 50 g of uh, uh, say fast acting carbohydrate in the form of sugar or candies wait for 50 minutes recheck blood sugar If blood sugar is 70 uh, above not above 70 repeat again 50 g of sugars and you once blood sugar sugar is corrected you then can keep on checking blood sugar every 30 minutes right and you have to maintain it above 50, right right so uh, uh, blood sugar is less than 50 then and patient is not able to take orally in that very situation you have to give uh, intravenous uh, glucose in the form of uh, 5% or more properly 25% glucose for uh, about uh, stat bolus of around uh, say 100 g or you may have to give 30 g fast acting carbohydrates decheck blood sugar and then uh, these are the certain ex- example of type of fluids which can be given in patients uh, with the uh, who are uh, able to take orally uh, these are the things which usually should not be considered as uh, appropriate uh, for managing hypoglycemia because they would not be absorbed very rapidly right. glucagon is another agent uh, which uh, can be used in emergencies to manage hypoglycemia usually give 1 mg or 1 unit for adults and it can be given both subcutaneously or intramuscularly or even intravenously right so you have to keep on checking blood sugar uh, blood glucose every hour or uh, two hour till uh, it is above 70 uh, at least on two or three consecutive readings uh, of course uh, a surgical patient uh, who require uh, glycemic control there are so many factors uh, resulting from stress that there is neuroendocrine release and there is a release of epinephrine glucagon cortisol growth hormone cytokine interleukin tnf and all these factors are responsible for uh, elevating the blood glucose level sepsis and hyperalimentation patient being npo or steroid use may further complicate it so this uh, setting is all set for that your patient may end up patient who has to undergo surgery may un- end up in dk or hypoxemic state or sometime it may do at hypoglycemia patient has been npo so there is careful pre operative history previous history of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia or uh, ketosis should be asked for you want to prevent uh, uh, say hypoglycemia you want to prevent uh, dk hhs and uh, avoid marked hypoglycemia the target glycemic level for uh, pre operative patient should be between something between uh, 110 to 180 mg per deciliter the fasting should be less than 140 random should be less than 200 uh, if uh, procedure is uh, short term less than 2 hours you may not to uh, say adjust much and just omit the rapid acting insulin in the morning but in long procedures you usually set up uh, an insulin free unit rate of 0.5 units per kg per hour and with per operatively you keep on monitoring the blood sugar level early and sometime uh, you may start them with the glucose insulin potassium infusion that you take 500 ml of 10% dextrose water at 10 ml equivalent potassium and 15 ml of insulin and start it at a rate of 100 ml per hour for during per operative period or till the patient is uh, npo so in conclusion The diabetic emergencies uh, are common in patient with diabetes uh, their effects can be devastating however with continued emphasis on the timely and appropriate identification and management of diabetic emergencies uh, hopefully this may change it is therefore important that uh, for those uh, with diabetes to keep their sugar levels normal to prevent complication and to be able to live normally healthy lives thank you very much for uh, your uh, the attention and particularly uh, for this uh, extra class which was uh, 
which is necessary to compensate for the, the delay we have had in uh, having some lectures during this COVID period. Thank you.